I really didn't think I'd be fighting a golden gorilla on the moon. I'm Anthony. I'm Damon. I'm David. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to issue number 139 of the Crimson Towel Comic Club Podcast. Each and every week we meet here to talk about comics. This week's episode has a lot of stuff to talk about. We have our club discussion on book three for Wonder Woman Dead Earth. Then we'll move over to the weekly review segment, which will go around the internet and everyone will talk about the books they've been reading, both new and old. Then over in the letters page, we have a discussion question, which will be what character death would make you stop reading comics? So we'll uh, talk about that later in the show, start thinking of your answers. Uh, and then also in the news, we will cover the independent previews for items coming out in September and beyond. So let's kick it off here with our club pick. This is the penultimate book for Wonder Woman, Dead Earth. Uh, number three, Princess Diana of Themyscira left paradise to save man's world from itself. When Wonder Woman awakens from a centuries-long sleep to discover the Earth reduced to a nuclear wasteland, she knows she failed. Marooned in a dark and dangerous future, Diana must protect the last human city from titanic monsters while uncovering the secret of this dead Earth and how she may be responsible for it. Okay, so... Um, that synopsis basically kind of gave us a little catch up uh talking about this uh you know the post apocalyptic uh earth this dead earth a lot of creatures and monsters the amazonians have been mutated into these monsters um we saw diana wake up and uh we saw her wearing the having the utility belt of batman we see her uh, coming across the cheetah in the last book. Um, and uh, this issue here, the overall is a lot of war, a lot of destruction, a lot of, a lot of monsters, a lot of discussion about what had happened with this dead earth and uh, basically kind of setting off uh, on a mission to go somewhere to possibly get some help, possibly get some answers that being the Fortress of Solitude. So that is the overall um, synopsis for this issue. What we're gonna do for a club discussion, if anyone wants to jump in, we can talk about some of our favorite parts, talk about you know, maybe some questions, things like that. Is there anybody here that wants to uh, jump right into Dead Earth number three? Well, before I forget about it, I'll just jump in with, um, th this calls back to something that was uh, introduced to us in, I believe it was the first issue. Um, when you see Diana as a, a younger girl, um, something happens where she's having a problem controlling her power. And so in this version, that's the reason for the bracelets is the, 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 the bracelets are put on to sort of dampen her power so that they're controllable. Um, I, I, I'd actually kind of forgotten about that um, from then until now. And then in this issue, then you remember that, um, yeah, th in this one, she's like seriously overpowered, um, if not for having the, uh, the bracelets on. And you find out what happens when they're removed. Um, which I'm um, looking for the page where they're taken off, but basically uh yeah they uh they 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 get taken back off of her and she goes uh because all these nuclear missiles are launched um at Themyscira um and she just with those taken off they still don't think that she's going to be able to stop them all but this at least gives her a chance to to stop it all uh unfortunately she kind of loses control she uh she, you know, not just physically loses control, but also mentally. And it causes her to do something, you know, she goes, she goes uh, a little crazy there and causes her to do something that she will later regret. Um, that of course is she has this encounter with Superman and 
she's uh, she's really able to in this overpowered state um, really um, give him the beating of a lifetime, you know. And it's just page after page of her just whooping Superman, um, which yeah. you know kind of kind of hurts me. It deeply affects me, you know, watching this. Yeah, this was a very uh, Anthony versus David issue as far as uh, when it comes to character battles here. So, yeah, but Where, uh, you know, you were feeling, you know, you know, feeling down and feeling some sadness. I'm sitting there. I'm just all hyped up. And yeah, she 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 grabs some kryptonite, and on top of like her being supercharged with all this power, grabs the kryptonite, fistful of kryptonite, and uh, <laughs> you know that. That that's the finishing move. Yeah, that silhouette. When she comes to uh, Themis or to the Fortress of Solitude, and finds you know Superman, uh, not the robot Superman, but the Superman in a chair, just, just dead skull. There's the awesome image from there. Um, I say awesome in quotes. Um, and uh, and just seeing like the hole through his chest, and then cutting to that silhouette action that you just showed us there. This is one of those issues that uh, you know, I was waiting, waiting for it to show up, and everybody was talking about it online, and uh, it just shut down for like three days until I could uh, get to it. And I'm glad I did because I didn't want to come across those pictures or hear about it until I read it for myself. Because yeah, it was a pretty, pretty crazy issue. Anybody else have any uh, thoughts, uh, questions, or anything like that for the issue? Well, I'll, I'm going to save my favorite part until a little bit later, um, but I think it's just kind of cool the way first, you know, in the first issue we see the ruined Batcave, then in the second issue we go to see Themyscira that's in destroy, been destroyed. Now we see the fortress that are, you know, and it, it been totaled. I just wonder what we're going to see next. Are we going to see? Uh, I'm guessing the Hall of Justice, I'm, maybe I'm the Watchtower. I'm predicting it's going to be, uh, it was a Jitters, the coffee place that Barry Allen and Iris always go to. I bet you it's going to be that. It's going to be just a coffee grounds everywhere and it just. Uh, just a uh, total mess again, yeah. Napkins. Coffee just, spilled coffee. everywhere. Yeah, just over the other, you know, the, the, the pots are just overflowing and they're still running and. You know, I thought, you know, when we first saw her, we, I, we kind of thought that um, uh, Barbara, uh, the cheetah, was uh, mutated. We find out what here that she wasn't mutated, but that some scientists actually tried some modifications to her and actually attached live cats to her arms instead of hands. So I hate when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, when she was going through in earlier issues, you don't know what they did to me and everything else. Well, now we know what they did to her, and it's uh, it's a little bit more gruesome than what we thought. Yeah. Um, Anyone else uh, jump in, uh, Damon? My uh, favorite part. I don't really want to spoil, but let's just say it's the last panel. The last yeah, I, I had a feeling. You know, I. I was going to pull that out. I wanted to give somebody else a chance, and I was thinking that might be what Jim was going. So you wanted to pull that out. Uh, is that yeah. a reference to anything? No pun intended. You know, I know this is me, but I didn't actually intend to pun that. <laughs> I think it's uh, neat. I'm going to go back uh, like three panels from where Damon was, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. she used yeah. to do that. Uh, she, she uh, looking over Superman's corpse, decides that there is a way that she can use uh, this tragedy to, um, to give her an advantage in this upcoming battle. Yeah, it's a scene straight out of Predator. And <laughs> I kind of took it like when Sarah Connor came out of the insane asylum and went after the Terminator. It's kind of what there you go. I got from this. But <laughs> I still don't understand the whole Wonder Woman thing and all these different powers and everything. So I just, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know Wonder Woman could fly. 
Yeah, I missed the invisible plane, the bracelets, the whip. Well, it's yeah, like... there there have been different versions where she could or couldn't. Um, oh yeah, she there's always had the invisible plane was so that she could fly when she couldn't necessarily fly. Otherwise, but even some versions where she could fly, she still had the invisible jet because, you know, I can walk, but sometimes I prefer to drive. Uh, Katie, do you have a chance to read this one at all? I did. I read it twice. Uh, I really liked this one. Um, th this is probably going to be one of my top contenders for series of the year. Like, I think it'd be in my top five so far that I really liked. Um, I like that we got some answers and felt like a sense of resolution and purpose as we go towards the final book. Um, you know, definitely is a sad story. I, I can't spin it any other way, but yeah, that last page reveal was nuts. That was so cool and so messed up. I, I am kind of sickened, but also excited to see how that's going to go and what they're going to do with that. Uh, it was nice to see Diana reconcile with some of the humans because she had been really mad at them and they were mad at her and very distrustful. So it was good to see that, um, you know, things are temporarily at least a little better and they understand each other more. So I really liked it. This is good. I, I enjoyed it a lot. So nothing but praise. Cool. Cool. Yeah. You said you had read it twice and I'm looking forward to reading it a second time because um, I liked it so much that not only did I get the first cover, but I also got the second cover because Daniel Warren yeah. Johnson also did that one. Okay. And I really dug that cover, so I uh, double dipped on this issue, and uh, I think if there was an issue to double dip on, I think I picked the right one here. So Yeah, I agree. So um, something cool about the format, uh, the first time I read it, I read it digitally, and that was very nice, but I have to tell you, it looks like 10 times better and makes so much more sense in the oversized format. Um, I'm doing a lot of digital issues right now for obvious reasons, but getting to have that big big copy and see all the art the way it's meant to be laid out really made me appreciate it so much more. That's awesome to hear. Um, one thing that is super cool for those fans of Daniel Warren Johnson, his previous independent series he did that I uh, spoke uh, very highly of on this podcast many a times, Murder Falcon, on the opening page of book three, you see some people looking up at a uh, uh, at a TV news screen thing going on, uh, Wonder Woman and Superman uh, breaking news. And uh, the guy in the red shirt there is uh, very similar to the guy, Jake, who is uh, one of our main characters, aside from Murder Falcon himself, um, who, yeah, it, it very much looks like him. And he's got the hairstyle. He's got kind of the, the red shirt. And I think Daniel Warren Johnson replied with like a winky face or something with somebody brought that to his attention and just said hey is this uh jake and you know so that's kind of a cool little easter egg that uh for daniel warren johnson fans cool, cool um yeah any other uh closing thoughts here before we move on at all um no i i'm amazed that nobody showed the the major spoiler but major spoiler. especially since you know we're all we're all about spoilers in the section and I will, uh, I will stick with that, and I will also not reveal it, so that uh, people, when they watch or listen to this, uh, can feel free to go, what are they talking about, and rush out and buy it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. truly, like, we, we could say everything about this book, but it's a whole experience to read it and just visually look at it. Uh, just the fight scene alone between Diana and Superman just is insane, and uh, uh, with... Daniel Warren Johnson doing the writing and the art, and then you got uh, Mike Spicer who's doing the awesome colors in here, Russ Wooten on letters. Uh, this is the combination. I'm pretty sure all three of them were the ones that had worked on uh, uh, Murder Falcon and possibly Extremity as well. So these are three creators that are very familiar with each other's styles and storytelling, and it's definitely very, uh, very uh, on... Uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It's very uh, evident. It's very. It's very, very. Um, but yeah, it's uh, just an awesome, awesome book. So yeah, if there is no other closing thoughts, we will uh, move on from this one, but we will return. I like yes. one thing. I, I like how um, the the robot is so very much like Clark Kal-El that even though uh, Diana killed 
the real Kal-El. The robot is still waiting for her and lets her in to come and help. He's open to forgive her right away, you know. Yeah, that was that was a cool moment there, and uh, it was good. Um, yeah, I think we are expecting what August, I think, for the last issue. If there were no other delays, but I think it was kind of back on track. So possibly August, we will get our final chapter to the Black Label Wonder Woman letters. Well, I don't know how closely uh, this is yeah. done, but it does say October on the back page. Oh, does it? Yeah, it does. It was on sale October twenty twenty. Okay, well, disregard everything I just said. Maybe the original was expected in uh, August, and then, yeah. All right. Uh, now we got to take it from the top. Well, yeah. <laughs> Start all over. Remember what you guys all said? So, yeah, um, we will see you in October. Uh, we'll have uh, Wonder Woman Dead Earth, and, uh, and then something called uh, uh, X-Ray Robot number three will be... But actually, the review will probably happen in early November. So, so yep, yeah, that will do it for our uh, club discussion here for Wonder Woman Dead Earth. Let's move on over to the weekly reviews. All right. Saved. Okay, I'm going to jump right into it here. Recording. <clears throat> Welcome to the weekly review section. We're going to go all around the internet and talk about the books that we've been reading, new and old. I am going to kick it off with uh, Boom Studios' Buffy the Vampire Slayer, issue number 14. Um, there is an issue number 15 that is out uh, that I had read as well, but I thought that this was a perfect uh, issue to uh, highlight here on the podcast. Kendra the Vampire Slayer and uh, the all-new Scooby Gang must defend Sunnydale from the aftershocks of the Hellmouth and a new threat that feels very familiar. But can they fill the void left behind by Buffy? And will this issue answer the question of what exactly happened to Buffy? The hardest thing in this world is to live in it. All right, uh, issue number 14. This is kicking off right after the uh, Hellmouth event. We did get uh, the issue prior to this was a Kendra focus. And thank you, Damon, for... Uh, getting Buffy in the background. That's one of the reasons why people should not only subscribe on iTunes and Podomatic, but also on YouTube when these videos will be posted. Um, so yeah, issue number 14 here is kind of a fresh start uh, post Helmo. What I really like this creative team, um, Jordi Belair has been writing, but we've had some rotating artists. This one has uh, Julian Lopez with uh, Moises Hidalgo, um, colored by Raul Angulo, with uh, Francesco Segala. All names very easily said. Um, what I liked uh, just right in the beginning, nine panels, uh, Watchman style, if you will, um, of uh, a very Sarah Michelle Geller looking Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, when you get some of the comic book art, you'll have some artists that uh, really lean into the likeness. Uh, like this artist, I think, was just on for one issue. And it makes sense because you go through it, you see the details in the likeness. Uh, and then you'll see some of the other artists who also have great art for it. But uh, they probably, uh, you know, it's not... Some, some artists work a little faster, and especially when you work on this detail. But right off the bat, uh, I thought that artist was doing a great job. Uh, we are seeing uh, Buffy and Robin, who is the... Uh, now ex-watcher to Kendra, uh, which is a fun little twist, because if you've seen the Buffy the Vampire television show, Robin Wood is the character who is uh, an elder uh, principal character in the later, uh, in the last season, rather, and is the son of one of the former Slayers. And this uh, continuity brings him early into the Buffy high school story, putting him in that younger age bracket, um, still having him uh, be a connection to the Slayer mythology, but uh, giving a little different uh, touch-up to the origin. Um, so you see Giles, who is now handling both Kendra and Buffy, 
as uh, having two slayers there. You've got Joyce, Buffy's mom, who is trying to connect with Buffy. Buffy's gone through quite a bit during the Hellmouth event, and there's still some stuff that is uh, kind of reeling from that uh, outcome, uh, dealing with the, the Scooby gang characters of your Buffy or Buffy, Xander, and Willow. I won't say specifically, but uh, some stuff has happened to Xander and Willow, uh, which is uh, left to the people to read this. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on in Buffy's life here. Uh, she's trying to connect with uh, Kendra. She's trying to connect with Robin. She's basically trying to connect with anybody, but she, much like this television series, she's been very standoffish, and she holds this uh, her, her destiny... Um, kind of leads her into a very sheltered life, something that uh, Jenny Callender, who is Giles's girlfriend, um, kind of brings up in this issue as well, is that, like, Giles, while being the, the watcher and the trainer and the teacher, the guide, um, still gets to have a normal life. He gets, you know, he's not in the, uh, out there fist fighting and things like that. And she kind of questions, like, what's, how come Buffy and Kendra don't get to have lives? And he's like, well, that's, that's part of the, you know, they're called to be a slayer. And so Jenny's kind of fighting for the idea of trying to give them basically to have a normal life as a teenager. And that's a theme that's basically has run through the television series and the event, you know, the sequel comics and stuff throughout the whole story of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But yeah, a lot of good stuff happened here. I uh, really dug this opening cover with Buffy kind of climbing out of the hell mouth and the cover art itself is kind of uh, on fire as it's burning up the top cover. Like this isn't something that can pull back and you start to see those panels that I showed you right there on the cover. So the design of that was super cool, which really made me lead to talk about issue number 14 and also number 15's out as well as the Buffy Generations one shot. So and as well as the Angel and Spike series. So a lot of stuff going on with Buffy. And actually this past uh, week, uh, Willow number one. So a lot of Buffy going on and uh, I'm excited for all of it. So that is my review for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, issue number 14. Now, Damon, are you going to talk about issue number 15 of Buffy? No, I will not. <laughs> oh, okay. Next week. Next week. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So... My review, my first review is not really com a comic per se, but it does deal with artwork. Um, this year uh, marks the 35th anniversary of Garbage Pail Kids. Nice. As a kid, when I was young in the mid 80s, I collected Garbage Pail Kid cards, uh, like some of my friends, and uh, I still have them to this day. Unfortunately, I can't find them. They're somewhere in my basement, a.k.a. storage unit. And I know I lost some in the move, um, which ticks me off. But for the 35th anniversary, I had picked up a hardcover book called Garbage Pail Kids. Um, this is covers the first five series of Garbage Pail Kids cards. Um, I have it in a protector, but the actual dust jacket is the same wax paper that the deck of the pack of cards used to come in and the back even looks folded so i thought that was cool um book which is a which is small to give you an idea that's a a comic book compared to, uh to the size of it but on the front it has the famous piece of gum which we would see when we open up the pack <laughs> but nine times out of ten that is what we would actually see when we open up the pack because oh, it's awesome. a million pieces um, this is a fun book. Um, the, the, uh, some of the different, uh, on the end pages is the, the card backs. And this has every card in order of the first five series. There's a little, uh, intro and then like series one, there's the picture of the pack. And then on the whole page is the actual <laughs> artwork of the card. It has the A name written in the card, and then for those that collected, there were also B names written here on the bottom. And of course, uh, the flagship, card number eight, is Adam Baum, who is also uh, on the logo for Garbage Pail Kids. 
with his B name blasted dude. So this has every single card with their B names below for the first five series of Garbage Pail Kids. So and you found a card for each one of the Crimson Cowl members. What's that? You found the card that goes for each one of the Crimson Cowl members. Uh, I could look that up. I didn't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> I know there's a Kevin. Uh, <laughs> can't remember what he was called but for someone like me who was a big fan this this was a lot of fun real nostalgia you know i i haven't been able to look at my cards for years they've been packed up somewhere so it was just neat to page through this you know this is my idea of a coffee table book there you go you yeah. know anyone can just pick it up page through it be grossed out and laugh a table or toilet reader and then in the back yeah, um, the back, the the end paper looks like what the display box would be, and then this is where the packs of cards were, and it actually comes with a pack Ooh. of four unreleased cards, like <laughs> one hole in one. Hole in one. <laughs> nice. So uh, the book was a lot of fun. It is a couple years old. I somehow missed it. But it is still available on like Target's website or Amazon. So it may be like a 40th anniversary, but the book is a 35th. No, no, I wish. Uh, also for the 35th, um, well, other things that go garbage pail kids is of course the pops, and I have the garbage pail kids number one, the atom bomb, who is their flagship. Um, there's four pops out so far. Um, atom bomb, ghastly Ashley, Clark Kent which would be right up David's alley. He's the Superman one right there. <laughs> and Beastly Boyd. And then specifically for this year, for Garbage Pail Kids, for the anniversary, they have the Thousand Piece Puzzle, Ooh. which I had to get. Um, I'm going to wait until Amy and I are done with school, and we're going to actually put this together and get a frame. And there is a Garbage Pail Kid Monopoly Whoa. that come out. So if you're a Garbage Pail Kid fan, this is it. And then, you know, they had the Blu-ray release. Uh, Screen Factory put out a real nice Blu-ray release of Garbage Pail Kids, which I have, even though the movie's kind of, well, I'll just say it. The movie sucks, but it's still fun. <laughs> so did Super Mario Brothers, but I watched it a few times. Yeah. <laughs> got to yeah. add it to the collection. You know. Yeah, you got to get it for the collection. So I was big into the cards as a kid. So I decided to talk about it because even though it's not a comic book, it is cool art, in my opinion. I mean, you can never go wrong with Garbage Pail Kids. Even as an adult, I was paging through here, looking at some of the names. I mean, the Rocky Horror Picture Show one was in here. And I was just... It sounds uh, astounding. <laughs> find him quick. There he was. <laughs> uh, it what's, the name? what's the name on that one rocky horror <laughs> nice and the b name was marty Graw. but uh yeah even as an adult i still find these fun and they're gross and disgusting and just cool <laughs> so that's why i wanted to bring it up um if you were into the cars or into this i i definitely recommend at least picking up the book yeah it's pretty cool it's fun to page through. And that's it for Garbage Pail Kids. So Shelly was right. She guessed correctly. <laughs> and she has Rocky Horror somewhere, but she couldn't find him. Excellent. I right. like my guess better. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't type a couple of mine. <laughs> we read some of the guesses. Because what you did is that you just put... Uh, GPK, yeah, um, GPK. Uh, which is on our on our Facebook page, and so there were guesses as to what that stood for. And yeah, I thought it'd be fun to keep people guessing. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what uh, David's title stands for on his pick here to keep us guessing. Actually, it's oh. funny because there is a comment on. You know, be ca being careful how you abbreviate this. I believe Superman actually tells these guys to be careful how they abbreviate the name. Talking about the All-Star Squadron. 
And uh, yeah, I think uh, I read the first three issues here. It's the first storyline in the book. Um, and uh, as, it, as it's wrapping up, I do believe. Yes. Uh, yep, here it is. Talking about how it's a pretty snazzy name. But be careful how you abbreviate it. Um, I got to pin your video. I can't. Uh... Uh, if you're uh yeah i guess it all over there um take the first letter of each word anthony you can guess what it says all <laughs> are quadrant um, but no yes okay General. i think i'm gonna pass on that one <laughs> Well, you know, it's made up of a lot of members of the JSA, but it's uh, the All-Star Squadron. Um, so All-Star Squadron, this, this book is uh, from 1981, um, and this is pre-crisis on Infinite Earth. So there was still like the Earth 1, Earth 2, uh, before that was all combined. And they wanted to do some stories using some of the uh, Justice Society of America uh, characters, but the idea was to actually set them during World War II rather than, you know, in, in current time. Um, and they also decided that they wanted to use some of the some of the characters that weren't as well known, but they felt had some potential. But rather than having just the Justice Society of America characters like Green Lantern and Flash and, and some of the top names like Superman and Batman, and Wonder Woman, they, they used some of the lesser known characters that they thought had some, some potential. And they formed a new group called the All-Star Squadron, which uh, in, in a lot of ways cleverly retconned um, some of these characters. Um, and this was a, a very early example of, of a retcon um, because before then there were continuity issues, you know, where some people would kind of ignore continuity, but this is, this is probably one of the early examples where somebody intentionally went back and made changes uh, to fit the storyline. Um, for example, two of the characters, uh, um, uh, Johnny Quick and Liberty Bell. Initially, they they had never been married in comics, but they they put the two together. Um, and in later issues, they get together, they marry. Um, eventually, they have a, a daughter named Jessie Quick, who uh, you might know from uh, from the Flash TV show, um, even though she's has different parentage in that show. Um, so they made some changes, they make some changes, um, beyond that, but, uh, but they also worked in some stuff. In the first storyline, the main villain is Per Dagaton, who his MO is, he's a time traveling villain who would, uh, go back in time, change some major events in history and try to take over the world in that way. Any time, you know, in the original stories, it was the, the Justice Society would thwart his plans. Um, and each time, because of it, it, everything would go back to normal and everybody would forget, including him, would forget what they did. They'd remember the events, but they couldn't remember who was involved and things like that. This storyline actually uses some of and fits the story in between his first couple appearances. Um, and they're able to use that whole everybody forgets what happens in, in doing this story. So, um, yeah, I, I just, wasn't something that I would normally pick up. Um, these aren't characters that I normally care about. Um, but you know, that was kind of the, the point of it. They are characters that most people didn't care, care about, but you know, they do have some, some potential there. Um, if you're just a society fan, you'll you'll recognize some of the characters like Hawkman or Doctor Midnight, the Atom. Um, 
A lot of the other members are in the story. They're just minor characters. Um, there's a plot that kind of right in the story, they, they take care of why Superman and Batman and those guys aren't involved in it. Um, and so it's able to focus on all these lesser known characters, but it puts them together. And I think it does a really good job um, of utilizing these characters in this new way. Um, by new, I mean in 1981. Uh, so I, I actually was, was quite interested. I thought it was uh, uh, well-written, you know, it, it's a good example of comics of its time. And uh, uh, it's, it's nice to have a complete storyline and only three issues. So it's not like it's something that goes on and on and on. Um, you know, now we get the, the long six issue stories, 12 issue stories. Uh, so it's kind of refreshing to go back and get something that's a complete story in just three issues. And I was surprised at how much story they actually were able to pack into it. So, uh, but again, that was the first three issues, All-Star Squadron, 1981. Excellent. All right, let's jump over to Kirby for the next pick. Necromancer Bill. Pet Cemetery meets every Seth Rogen movie ever made as a regular schlub Bill is accidentally granted the power of necromancy. In other words, Bill can now raise the dead, which proves not to be as much fun as it sounds. Oh, and did we mention that Bill's tutor is a talking raven with a substance abuse problem? <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> this was <laughs> all the way through. It was a lot of fun. The raven, I can't remember his name offhand. Larry, right? What is it? Larry, I think. Yeah, it is Larry. Yep. <laughs> and he's basically, Bill's basically the sidekick to Larry. But uh, Bill has powers, well, it says to raise the dead, but it's also to destroy the dead. So uh, he accidentally raises a few too many dead the first chance as he tries. And has to fix that error, but apparently someone that was trained with the same name as Bill was being given the powers and when he was given the powers it went to this bill instead of the one with the same name that they were training so the crows got himself in a bunch of trouble he used to be a human i'm assuming and he got turned into a crow for punishment and then he was supposed to overwatch on bill and then decided to help train bill and see what could happen see if he could get it could get on the good graces yeah there's tons of excitement beyond that Lots of fun in here. Yeah, what do you else read this? <laughs> Larry's got the two little like mouse and rat buddies there who are uh, kind of fun oh, yeah. in the book as well. You know, sitting there drinking some beer and yeah, it's uh, a lot of fun. Uh, a story about uh, Bill, who his lifestyle as we meet him, he is a he's a divorcee. He loves to garden. He's got his own garden. His ex-wife uh, in the opening scenes, uh, we can see that she still controls him, even though she's got a new guy. And uh, they have a boat that they had bought together. And she comes in and demands the key for it. And he very willingly gives up the key. Uh, Larry, throughout the series, kind of talks about, you know, not letting her control his life, especially since they're divorced and uh so that kind of paints a picture of uh bill and where he sits so he's just could not be a nicer guy when it comes to you know his values and what he what he stands for so for him to be given this power and thrust into this crazy dark deadly world and job is uh quite the you know quite a great transition and uh yeah, it's it, it's basically a lot of fun. It was a really, really quick read. I think a lot of the humor really drove that. There wasn't any chapters in here that made me just be like, all right, I'm done. I'm going to pick this up tomorrow. Like, I just wanted to keep reading it. And I think that was just a testament to the, the pacing and the comedy and everything. But, yeah. yeah. I want to see a dozen more of these with him getting his powers under control and stuff. I could see this being a lot of fun. And I could definitely see Seth Rogen playing it, but I could also see me playing it with Anthony Ayer and Damon's 
go with tea. So. <laughs> um, you just got to get the Seth Rogen laugh, and then you're good. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I really like this. Uh, you talked about it when we uh, did one of our very famous preview segments, which we'll do later in this episode. Um, but you had talked about it, and I had completely missed it. And you bring it up, and I was just like, "Wait, this sounds great." And that opening line, it's just Pet Cemetery meets every Seth Rogen movie ever made, was uh, as much of a sell as I needed for a synopsis. So, so that yeah. really, really pays how much, uh, you know, a hidden gem like this could be lost in the catalog of 500 plus pages. And uh, good thing Kirby uh, caught caught his eye on that one because, yep, it was well worth the purchase. So. Definitely worth it. <laughs> so, yeah, good, good. All right, uh, we will jump back into a galaxy far, far away with Katie's next pick. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad that I can be the ambassador for Galaxy Far, Far Away. But this time it's going to be going way longer, long time ago. Uh, this book I, is called Lost Tribe of the Sith, Spiral. This is set thousands of years before the movies. It's set before the Old Republic books I've been talking about the past few weeks. Um, so kind of the premise is the there's an ancient group of Sith on a planet. They've been stranded there for thousands of years. Um, there's a whole tribe of them because the rule of two has not yet been put in place. And the two main characters are called Takara. She's kind of like the daughter of one of the noble families in the area. And then Spinner. And Spinner is a hooligan. He's kind of the local anarchist. And together... Uh, they get stuck on an adventure that takes them to another continent on this planet that their people haven't been to for a long while. And while they're there, they uh, unleash an ancient Sith Lord who has been kind of stuck in an artifact, I guess, in suspended animation. And because, you know, he's a Sith Lord and he's really bitter about his imprisonment, he uh, tries to immediately take over the continent. And we'll see how that gets thwarted or not. Um, so something cool about this book is that there were dragons, which automatically makes me happy. Uh, they're called Sith Leviathan in this universe, but great big animals that have magic powers and can sort of fly. Uh, there's creatures called Uvak, which are uh, look a little bit more like European style dragons, and they have wings and people can ride them. So I've really appreciated that. Uh, love me some dragons. That's a great way to sell me a book. So another nice, uh, well, not nice, but interesting fact about this book is that they don't have spaceships. They are not a star-faring society at this point. There's only been one spaceship in the history of this planet, and it has been hidden away for a long time, and that's important to know for this book. Um, what else? So, you know, this felt not so much like a Star wars -y book, but almost like old-school high fantasy. Like, think uh, the Wheel of Time, the Silmarillion, the, uh, the Shannara books, where... Magic is very much a part of their way of life, and it's very low technology, but a pretty advanced culture, and then just a lot of infighting. It's almost like what we'd see in Game of Thrones, where it's different groups scheming to be on top of their cruddy little hill of mud, but they are all very, very uh, insistent on being on top of that. So I really liked that. Obviously, I have a lot of background in high fantasy uh, so I enjoyed that element in Star Wars. Um, it's pretty cool because obviously George Lucas was inspired by some of that same stuff. If not directly, at least indirectly, he was aware of it. So I really liked that. Um, I would say for people who are not already deeply invested in obscure corners of the Star Wars timeline, you're going to want to pull up the Wikipedia page for some of this because, you know, there's a lot of background knowledge to know and none of this really connects to what we see in the movies. So even I found that helpful. But I really liked it. This is one I picked up from The Great Purge, part one. And it was definitely worth it. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, there's the book also called Lost Tribe of the Sith by the same author, John Jackson Miller. And I would say that one is required to understand this series. But definitely fun. Definitely interesting. I'm glad I picked it up. Well worth the money. That is Lost Tribe of the Sith Spiral by John Jackson Miller. All right. Cool, cool. That was a nice trip down the old Star Wars, Star Wars lane. So now we're just going to detour to a Devil's Highway. Devil's what? Highway from uh, AWA Upshot Publisher. 
Uh, this is a 105, and this was the first issue. Uh, and this is from, okay, the, the primary thing I want to focus on for us is the setting. As Drift County, Wisconsin. As, there you go. Which is not a real Wisconsin county, but okay, yeah. it's still Wisconsin. It's obviously set someplace in the north woods of Wisconsin. It uh, shows lots of pine forests around. It also shows mountains, which I don't think we really have mountains of, but maybe that's Rib Mountain. Okay. But it starts with a uh, small diner in the middle of winter. Um, it's apparently right before Christmas. An old man's asking the cook what you're doing for the holidays, and you're welcome to come over. And he says, no, that's okay, because Sharon's coming home. And then a young woman comes crashing into the building. She approaches the window, runs in the house, you know, runs into the diner and says, you know, help me, help me, help me. Woman's wearing just a t-shirt and her underwear. And then things go dark and he tells her to run. And then it cuts away to a few days later when a young woman, a different young woman, walks into the local sheriff's station. And then a couple of deputies who are kind of like, screwing around at their desks say Sharon what are you doing here we haven't seen you in years so apparently this is a Sharon from the opening scene and she demands to see the case file on her father so apparently that was her father who was the cook in the first scene and she intimidates them into showing her the case file she proceeds to investigate um, and is apparently getting more out of the case than the police were able to do and uh, discovers, she actually goes to the funeral home and investigates her father's body and finds that he has been branded with uh, Uberos, which is the snake eating its own tail. And then uh, does some further investigation and goes to the truck stop and the crime scene and then and then it cuts away to another crime scene this one is near Eau Claire Wisconsin and we see another young woman except this one is laying out in the woods and here we go there we go she mm. has been branded with the Uberos Let's see. Yeah, oh, let's see. There you go. And then we see the snake actually crawling out of her mouth. And that's the end of the book. So this was one that it sounded interesting right out of the catalog for me. And then later on, I was, you know, had the opportunity to read some other um, books from AWA Upshot. And they've all been really good so far. Um, this is, they've been really good with horror stuff and weird stuff and this one definitely fits into it um damon i think you would like this title as well so i don't know if they're going to do trades or not but keep an eye on that one yeah cool 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 all right uh for the next title up here is from robert kirkman and charlie adler um to get into this book we first got to talk about uh the surprise ending issue of the walking dead issue number 193 we talked about it on this very podcast uh when it came out last summer it came as a surprise as they had solicited uh, the further issues after that and then when you got the book it was triple size for a single comic price and we find out uh, it's, you know, kind of jumping into the future a little bit. And we find out it is the last issue of The Walking Dead with issue number 193. Uh, Robert Kirkman had an explanation, just kind of a farewell letter towards the back. And uh, talked about just the process of coming up with that decision and the storytelling and knowing it was time to uh, put an end to the series. And uh, he signed his name and he says, P.S., Negan Lives. And that's what brings us into this review of Negan Lives number one, 
which is a surprise one shot to uh, the comic book stores. So Robert Kirkman, with the whole pandemic going on, decided to take this and use this opportunity and um, ship these comics for free. I, I think they were based off of, I don't know if there were issue 193 orders um, that they had based it off of. They had done the similar thing when he surprised comic shops with Die, Die, Die and uh, people that had uh, whatever numbers they pre-ordered for Oblivion Song, his other series that's currently going as well. Um, basically found a way to ship these books to a comic shop. Uh, they were going to cover all the costs for it. That way the comic shops can you know, sell it for the cover price, which was about four ninety nine, I think, on this one. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, take use the benefits from that and uh, uh, help comic shops in need. So Negan Lives number one is uh, picking up with the character of Negan, who left in, I looked into it, it was like issue like 170 something, where the character sort of had a farewell. We see him uh, very briefly in that finale, but I don't think he had a speaking part in there and he was just kind of left um waiting in the wings and i think david and i we were talking about um how we could totally see a negan series happening after him ending the walking dead and you know um you know less than a year later we have negan's uh lives number one which is you know billed as a one shot at the moment um but it is following up the character of negan who has kind of put his uh uh, wife Lucille um, on the back burner a little bit. We've seen Lucille, which is uh, his bat's name that he had named after his uh, deceased wife. Uh, if you want some more history on that, you can actually check out the very recently released uh, Here's Negan hardcover, um, which was uh, like a digital only series, but is uh, um, or a graphic novel rather. Um, you can check that out. That is available. And that tells the origin story of Negan and especially his wife. So that's a good companion piece to uh, this issue here. And this follows uh, Negan kind of being approached by a random stranger and uh, him kind of having some doubts. And uh, you see it's kind of a setup. Uh, it's an issue that is set up uh, where he's kind of just living his own life, but uh, he's just always down on everything that had happened with his wife he's a very depressed character uh while he can be very violent and vulgar uh, from when the very moment we met him in the series when you really get down to the core of negan you can see where he came from to get to this point and this lady this random stranger is kind of playing off of those emotions uh and while he's kind of being uh outnumbered here Negan still has that mentality of just, you know, not caring much about life, uh, being very strong at the same time. I would say he's weak and strong almost equally in the same beat sometimes. Uh, but yeah, this was a, a really good telling of this issue. And I don't, I don't want to go into much more, but I'm hoping this is one of those things that this is the one shot and then also number two will come out, you know, maybe months down the road. Um, yeah, don't you want to see what happens next? Uh, I would like to see, because as David and I talked about, we kind of said, yeah, we could see a Negan series happening, and I'd be, I would be all over that. So it was pretty cool to kind of get this one shot here. So I really dug it, especially with this cool cover with the red title, and then if you catch the glare on it, you've got the the red blood splatter kind of shines a little bit. And, uh, yeah, blood splatter cover but i'm curious what david's gold lettering cover has is this also have gold splatter or not it's red oh, okay oh but the actual because right now it looks like the the lettering is yellow is that are we seeing the this gold. yeah they uh there were a couple of variants uh, you got the gold incentive that's worth one thousand dollars there's also silver. Ooh, and I just noticed, uh, just by looking at yours there closely, um, the design of the letter G in Negan is the Lucille bat. Yes, it is. Oh, wow. yep. That's pretty cool. I didn't notice that till right now. So, 
I'm curious to look back on the other, uh, the hardcover and uh, to see if that's something that has been there or was invented for this cover logo there. But um, David, did, did you read it at all? I did, yes. Any thoughts on uh, the issue? Um, Megan's never been my favorite character. Um, I was surprised that it was a character that they kept around for as long as they, they did. Um, but I got to say, after the, uh, I won't even say abrupt ending, I, I expected The Walking Dead to be ending um, not, not much longer, you know, after when it actually did. Um, but it was nice to uh, see them going back. Um, and Negan can be used as a way to revisit this world without, you know, bringing back all these other characters and going back into The Walking Dead but you still get to go back into this world. And from the few pages we, uh, we showed, you know, obviously they're still zombies. They're still in that world. Um, and it, it sets it up. I, I don't know what's coming next. You know, uh, we know that this was one shot, but with that, that ending, uh, clearly it's setting up for there to be more. So I don't know if we'll see uh, a series, if we'll see some sort of a, a mini or, a series of minis or one shots. Um, but this book sets it up for Negan to go on a journey. Um, and uh, so I, I think that could actually be a very interesting uh, uh, journey you know, to, to go back um, to some of the things that I liked about earlier issues of The Walking Dead to see, you know, people out traveling across this world and to see other things that are going on in this world. Uh, so to have the possibility of a Negan book where you actually get to see other things that we haven't seen yet, to not necessarily be going to, uh, you know, Alexandria or any of these places that we've seen, you know, there's a, there's a whole country that we haven't seen in the comics um, of this, this Walking Dead world. And this allows for the possibility of us to get to see a whole lot more of it. Yeah, there's a lot of undiscovered country within The Walking Dead. So, um, Kirby, you read it as well? Yeah, I liked it. It The first half, it was too lighthearted of, it, of a Negan for me. But the second half, I was glad to see he found himself a young piece of All-Star Squadron that he was smart enough to know what to deal with, with that. But yeah, I, at the end, I'm like, I want more. And I don't, when you have a one shot, a true one shot, will say one shot, whereas you do have the number one. So it leaves you hanging. So I, I really hope they do at least five more issues to this, but, but yeah, there's, I want more of a story to go with it, but yeah, I, I liked it. I think Robert Kirkman's just going to wait till the next pandemic and then we'll get issue number two. So yeah. well, here's hoping. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else read it while we're going around? Anyone else pick it up or get it or. I have it, but I ran out of time and didn't get a chance to read it this week. So hopefully we didn't give too much away and you'll still enjoy it. <laughs> <Still> too much. <laughs> I on purpose. So I didn't hear anything. Oh, okay. Watch out for that all-star squadron. All right. Uh, so, yep, that is uh, Negan Lives, number one of 193. So um, let's move on to Damon for the next one. Okay, Sleeping Beauty is number one. Um, a couple years ago, Stephen King released a book called Sleeping Beauties, um, which I read. Uh, big Stephen King fan. Um, book was good, but like so many of his books, especially in the later half of his career, the book is great. The ending sucks. Um, this one, the ending was all right, but overall it, it meant to a good book. I don't remember a lot of little details cause it's been a couple years since I read it, but they started the comic book series. Uh, sorry about that. Siri wants uh, to review it. Yeah. Siri wants to get in on it. You know, it, the story is written by Stephen and his son, Owen. And the comic book series um, is based on the novel. It's adapted by Rio Yours, 
Art is Allison Sampson. I haven't really heard any of these names, but I thought it'd be interesting to see the comic book adaptation and see where it goes. Um, some things are a little different, but for the most part, um, there's a bizarre sleeping sickness that has fallen all over the world. Kind of similar to what's going on now. It started in Australia, hit our West Coast, and started crossing the whole country. Um, However, in this story, it only affects women. Sorry, Katie. But the rest of us, hey. Um, and the, this takes place in the small town of Dueling, where on the outskirts is a woman's prison. So you could see where that might be some trouble. And um, basically what the sleeping sickness does is when a woman goes to sleep, she never wakes up. She stays in like a comatose state. And this like mysterious, you could call it webbing, or like here on this bottom picture, you can see it starting to kind of form. The best way to kind of describe it would be like the strands, if you ever saw like the uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, <laughs> kind of overtake her. And what you end up with is she's like cocoon but she's still alive. And the problem is if you try to wake them, they become very, uh, they're unconscious. They don't know what they're doing, but they'll attack and kill whoever's disturbed them. And then when the threat is dead, they go back into their comatose state and this webbing encapsulates them again. This first uh, issue tells the tale of this mysterious woman who walks out of the woods. She is naked, but you don't see anything. Um, she walks out of the woods, kills a couple of druggies in their trailer, and that's the start of the uh, badness that happens in this town. The sheriff is a woman who's coming off of a late shift, so she's already exhausted. She has to respond to these murders and finds the woman uh, walking the street along the way. Her plan is to take her to the prison, um, and that's as far as we kind of get. The sleeping sickness is starting to overtake the town and the bad things are starting to happen. The art is kind of different. Like here's like an action page with some shooting and, and, and blood. Um, and just to give you an idea of the art, it's kind of different, but it's setting it up. I believe this is gonna be a 10 issue run. So they're gonna try to do that big of a book and 10 little issues. So obviously a lot's gonna be cut out and the story's gonna be changed because it's gonna be an adaptation. So Maybe it's- a better ending. I'm hoping it's probably a better ending. Um, this ending was okay. It's not like some of his other books. Like I pretty much have his whole collection and there are some books that the ending just, oh. Like uh, the worst case is uh, Under the Dome, which they actually made into a TV series. That book is like 1,600 pages. It's huge. It's probably the thickest book I've ever read. And the book was great. The last 100 pages, turd fest. <laughs> um, ruined the whole book. But Good thing they were under the dome. when the Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and then the series is completely different. I mean, everything. Was, don't even get me started on that. But, but anyway, back to Sleeping Beauties. Um. They don't give you a lot in this first issue, so it's hard for me to judge where it's going to go. I know I have my memories of the book, and as you can imagine, with all the women unconscious, you could just imagine what would happen. You know, people panic, they start burning bodies, some try to rape. It's, it's just a big mess, and I'm interested to see how they're going to translate all that into the comic book format. So... Um, can't really give an opinion yet. The first issue is really just, it doesn't give you too much. Um, it just starts to get going on the last page. So I have the other couple, next couple of uh, issues coming. So I'll be able to give a better opinion then, but it is Stephen King. So it might be a good take. And if you haven't read the book or don't have time to read the big book, and if the story is interesting, this might be the way to go. Okay. All right. Let's jump over to Kirby for the next one. All right, I bought Strike Force number six, I believe it was a while back, because Deadpool does a Monster Island thing. 
I wanted to know more about the rest of Strike Force, and I found at the comic book purge, I found issue one through three. I'm going to read some of the synopsis from the second one here. Mission report. Back during the War of the Realms, all Mother Freya destroyed a corrupted rainbow bridge called the Black Bifrost, unknowingly releasing hordes of plant-based shapeshifters called Bride Eye. Spreading across Earth, the Bright Eye have secretly been gathering resources, but they showed their hand when they kidnapped a seemingly random group of heroes and used their forms to steal a batch of deadly diseases. The Avengers caught the rogue heroes, and when Blade recognized the signs from a previous encounter he'd had with the Bright Eye in Berlin, he took the lead, asking the other Avengers to steer clear. Knowing of the Bright Eye is itself a poison, one he's determined to keep from spreading. Tracking the Bright Eye to Indonesia, Blade's makeshift team confronted the shapeshifter's ruler, Count Ophidian, but they didn't anticipate the appearance of Damon Hellstrom. Characters in here that are part of the team, well, Blade's the lead of the team. Angela, Spectrum, the Winter Soldier, Bucky, Spider-Woman, Wiccan, and Damon Hellstrom. It's a fun group of people. I never read any Strike Force before. I've seen they had tons of characters that I liked it in and in different issues that I wanted that was sucking me in that I want to start reading it. But this got me into it after seeing that number six. And I was assuming Deadpool was going to be part of the group. I don't know if he becomes part of it later on. But it's just, yeah, it's definitely worth the ongoing. And if you have come across any more for the next purge, set them aside for me. So I'm looking for the rest of them. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's fun series. Check it out. Yeah, it seems like the War, War of the Realms in general has been pretty well received when it comes to the uh, the main event. And then I know Dr. Kurtzstad uh, read a lot of the spinoffs and such and spoke very highly of them. So I think that was a – a very well structured event for the Marvel Universe. So. Yeah, a lot of shape shifting, a lot of people getting taken over. You don't know who's real and who's the shapeshifters. So. Yeah, it's definitely fun. Cool, cool. And uh, if he ends up listening to this later, please disregard me not noticing. But I assume Jim had to leave since his yep. last review. Yeah, he just he just snuck out. Okay. Because um, yeah, uh, you. <laughs> they all switch around with pin videos and stuff and then next thing i noticed he was gone yeah okay. i had it on the speaker view so i didn't see right away too and then i went wait a minute right. well see you later jim we hardly knew ye <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about sabrina uh the teenage witch this is part of the something wicked number one this is the uh, volume two of the critically acclaimed Sabrina Teenage Witch series by Kelly Thompson and Veronica and Andy Fish. Sabrina saved the day, saved her friends, her family, the whole town of Greendale, really, and she should be riding high. But things are never quite that simple. She's trapped in a love triangle. She's having trouble balancing the mortal and witch parts of herself. Oh yeah, and she's being blackmailed. As if that wasn't enough, while trying to help Radka and Ren with their supernatural problem, her aunts are suddenly people she can't trust. What a teen, uh, what's a teen witch to do? Um, this creative team I uh, was super excited for. I was going to buy the book uh, regardless. But uh, once they put uh, Kelly Thompson on there, one of my favorite writers of the last couple of years, and then Veronica and Andy Fish, awesome artists. Um, they're telling a great story here. I think it kind of balances uh, halfway between the world of uh, uh, where Sabrina, the character, lies in all of pop culture. It's not super, you know, kitty and goofy and cartoony. It's not super dark and gritty and whatever. It's a perfect balance right in the middle of both of those things. So it has the flavors, has some fun of a Melissa Joan Hart-esque uh, Sabrina. And then it does bring in uh, here and there some of the darkness of the chilling adventures of Sabrina as well. So it's just a great balance all around. This is a new number one, but this is a volume two of this story. I think it does really serve as a good jumping on point if you missed out on the first one. 
Uh, but yeah, Sabrina is dealing with the idea that she uh, has these two lifestyles, the witch lifestyle and trying to have a normal high school life as well. Some characters we met in the last volume um, have this uh, supernatural ability of turning into this Wendigo character. So we're still dealing with the ramifications of that. Uh, we have Sabrina that is kind of dealing with uh, the love triangle that it said in the premise there with uh, Harvey Kinkle and Wren. Um, but there's a cool scene in here, which uh, she goes to this uh, Christmas store. And it's, I guess I would have to look back to see what kind of month we're in anyways. I don't, it might be just one of those, you know, year round Christmas stores, but there's something that is special about this. July. Yeah. Um, something special about this Christmas store as it's kind of a secret uh, hideaway for some uh, some witch activities. So it, it's kind of a new little venue that is being placed in here. As the synopsis said as well, is that uh, there's some stuff going on with Hilda and Zelda that is going to leave Sabrina to not trust her uh, aunts uh, that much leading into this volume. But yeah, I was super excited to have this back. Um, a lot of fun. Uh, once again, I think it serves very well as it's a standalone volume. So if you weren't able to seek it out or don't want to rush around to try to find it and you have this one there, this could be a good jumping on point. But I think the creator is doing a good job in telling, once again, bringing both versions, Sabrina, and meshing them together into its own type of thing. So best of both worlds, as Hannah Montana once said. Um, that will do it for Sabrina, the Teenage Witch, Something Wicked, number one. And let me just go back to the list here. All right, then uh, let's jump over to Damon. This is Undiscovered Country, number six. Um, been waiting for this one, finally got it. This is the last issue in the first story arc. Anthony, have you read this one? I know you've been following this. I have it on an order that's showing up because there was that missed uh, order delivery. So mine is uh, mine is waiting to show up yet. So feel free to – I'm pretty good with just kind of drowning out things too, so say what you want. Well, I, I, I'll keep it kind of spoiler-free. But the nice thing with this book is it gives a two-page um, – this is a almost a double issue size – um, it gives a nice two-page synopsis of the story so far. Cool. So I must admit, just reading it in words, though, it kind of leaves a little to be desired. You really should read the first five issues to really get the impact. But this picks up right where issue five left off with the chase. Destiny Man is chasing our group of heroes. Um, there's two battles going on. There's the battle with the uh, pilot up on top of the wall, and the artwork is still fun. Um, very violent, bloody, real weird creatures like a flying buffalo and weapons and the dialogue Does with these people. Wings? Is, what's that? Does it use buffalo wings? That no, one? no, no buffalo wings, but here's a picture of the buffalo flying. Well, it was, you know, once the America started to kind of fall apart, the, uh, the Buffalo Wild Wings restaurant logo mascot got, got turned into that, so. Yeah, but I mean, there's all kinds of crazy here. I mean, you got land sharks pulling, you know, Destiny Man's, uh, you know, vehicle. Um, there's there's all cr types of crazy and everything going on. But anyways, this whole story so far was trying to get the key to get into the next section of America. America is divided now into like five or six sections. And Destiny Man controls this one section, and everyone's trying to get out because the next section is the country is supposed to be so much better. And um, this is the chase. They have the key. They're trying to get to the doorway. Destiny Man is chasing them. Um, obviously, I, I don't want to spoil too much for Anthony, but obviously they get through the gate um, because that's where the story continues. And then they got some interesting choices to make. And that's where I'm going to leave it. But it sets up beautifully for the end of a first movie. And just like it's the end of the first story arc. And 
the next one's slightly going to be even better. And then, of course, in the special features, you get more uh, quotes from the world history of people in this world of what they remember when America sealed themselves up. We finally have the full completed timeline of the seven years of events leading up to America sealing themselves off the wall. That's always fun to read. We got letters from both Charles Soule and Scott Snyder. And in here, um, this book, it, took, it wasn't even finished. These letters were written in May of this, uh, May of 2020. And they've been locked up since uh, March, trying to finish everything. Every day, they said during the quarantine, they've been working on this. They've completed the massive breakdown of the Undiscovered Country film. So that's going to be hopefully rolling soon. I noticed, uh, if I remember correctly, the last time I read up on it, they were looking at making it three films, a trilogy. So I hope there's going to be three arcs, and each film follows the arcs. But, you know, they give you uh, progress on where everything is going. And coming in July is number seven, which will be the start of the new arc called Unity. It's July. Yeah, I know. I, I, don't even, I don't even know when it's actually coming out. I'm just so happy to finally get six to finish that first, first story arc. Anthony, when you get it, I highly recommend. That's one of the first things you dive into to finish the, finish the run. Yeah, and yeah. I'd like you to talk about it or bring it up on one of the podcasts so we can. Well, that $10 one, that was issue one through six in there, wasn't it? What's that? The $10 graphic novel version that yep. they just, they came out with, that was issue one through six, right? Yep. I actually have that ordered. That came out uh, this week. Wednesday was the release date for one through six. Yeah. It's like 10 bucks. You can order it from like Amazon or Insect Trades for like five and a half bucks. I got it because Amy really wants to read it and I don't want her to read my singles. <laughs> don't blame me <laughs> if this becomes a real popular franchise i have first printings on every single one especially the first issue i don't really want it damaged um and plus i actually want to reread these and don't want to deal with digging them out of my boxes and untaping them so for five bucks i'd rather just have the trade too so i can reread it that way and have the full first arc so yes i recommend getting the trade if you like mad max if you like the idea that America sealing itself off from the world. When you read the completed timeline of the events leading up to America doing this, it's not too far away from where we are right now. I could see something like this happening. Um, like, what happens on. in the country, though, that's, that's odd. There's a whole big uh, time difference. What happens inside the walls, the length of time, is different than the length of time outside the walls. And that's all I'm going to say. I don't want to really spoil too much, but it's a fun sci-fi violent action adventure story. I highly recommend it. If you're into like Mad Max and those kind of stories, this is for you. It looks like number seven is currently scheduled for the last Wednesday of July. Um, whether or not that's an updated source, but just FYI. Um, and then you were talking about like, uh, you know, keeping the first printings, uh, nice and neat and everything. Uh, an alternate, um, idea I've been using mine as coasters for my drinks here. Every week we've been doing the zoom. I got my issue number one, first printing undiscovered country. And I just nestle, nestle that water, wet. It's got like a lot of residue underneath, you know, it's starting to sweat and everything, but the, the cover one really picks it up well so it doesn't get out of my countertop here so i'd recommend using your coffee mugs instead of your water bottle that really adds character to the comic book cover is that right the, okay the nice round ring and everything but once in a while when i make a martini i'll uh i'll cover it with uh with a comic so i can give it a good shake huh? yeah. yeah you don't want any of that getting out so it's good to use the paper to yeah, uh, really block it. absolutely all right, um, Kirby, you're next. All right, well, I bought Sharky the Bounty Hunter number one, and then I went to the Great Comic Book Purge and bought Sharky the, Con <laughs> the Bounty Hunter number one. <laughs> then I went to the Comic Book Purge, the second Purge, bought number two, three, four, five, and six, all in the sketch covers. It's like, if you have any more of these, too, you can set those aside for me. 
But uh, I have like two, three, four, five. And I got two through six. Well, one through six. But if you have the number one sketch cover, I'd like to get that. But but yeah, this is way better than I thought. I held off on it. I was originally going to start it, and I'm like, yeah, it's going to be kind of cheesy. But this is great. This is better than the Mandalorian. This is like the Mandalorian and Guardians of the Galaxy combined, because you got Sharky here. With his little green sidekick, he's a child, uh, roughly, I think, five, six years old or so. Roughly, he was running around with space pirates or whatever you want to call it, thieves and stuff, and doing stuff like Quill would have done when he was running around with Yandu. But uh, Sharky ends up getting his dad, well, his uncle or his dad, whatever, busted, thrown in prison, so Sharky's got to take the kid to his home planet or where other families are so he can go live with them. And Sharky's kind of puts it off, goes back, gets the kid, says heck with it, does it. He's got some big money bunny, bunnies, bonies to go after. So he ends up taking the kid I know is with him. The kid ends up doing lots of things to help out. He's got tons of experience flying ships and doing stuff like that, using weapons and stuff. So he's very helpful. And throughout this, they kind of get really close. Uh, <laughs> there's creatures in here that do body modifications, just unimaginable body modifications and stuff like that you can get done to yourself. Like one gal that Sharky hooks up with, she's got tires for feet, <laughs> robot or robot type legs and stuff. And she's gradually working on turning herself into a complete tank, a human tank that can go around and transform and stuff. Kind of uh, like a tank girl or something. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you got characters that are float, just floating around in space, no outfits on or anything like that. I don't know how they can deal with the atmosphere and stuff like that. So it's very interesting. Tons of different ship styles. And, and it's basically – just like Star Wars would be, and just, I think it's way more fun, and I basically ate these last five issues up in no time, I just went right through them, and I just want more and more and more of that, it's just, it's very fun. (laughs) uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, if you do like The Mandalorian or Guardians of the Galaxy, it's definitely something you'd enjoy. Yeah, uh, for anyone following, uh, as part of the the Miller world, Mark Miller, who uh, struck that Netflix deal a couple years back, they are in development of like anything like the Magic Order, this, there, there's so many things, some Jupiter Circle, some older stuff from Miller world is all being made into televisions and uh, television shows and movies. Sharky is being one of those as well. So uh, um, American Jesus was another one. Not sure what the order of everything's going to be, but it sounds like the Jupiter's Legacy and Jupiter's Circle, that superhero tale. Super awesome. A lot of great uh, actors casted for that one. I think they're really going to surprise a lot of people. And Netflix in a post-Marvel world of not having like the Defender seasons and all that kind of stuff. um, It's comics like this that I think is really going to catch a lot of attention and there's a lot of great stories. So plenty of time to catch up on those comics. What's that? You could go so far with this with movies yeah. and series. And the the only downfall to some of this stuff, Mark Miller, even though he finds awesome artists uh, working on all these different series, he does do a lot. So when it comes to getting a second volume of some of these mini series, it's a lot uh, fewer and far between um, because he's just balancing so many plates and working on this. But uh, so hopefully we will get some more Sharky. Uh, maybe in time for when the show or movie comes out too, but yeah, good stuff. Yep. All right. Um, and I think you're taking us home with the rest because Jim had a couple more. It was going to work out perfectly, but now you're left to uh, entertain the masses. I can pump this out pretty quick. So I survived the zombie apocalypse and all I got was this podcast. <laughs> this is a small graphic novel. Very fun. Mara Mitchell, gardener, podcaster, zombie apocalypse survivor. In a lonely compound in the midst of a zombie apocalypse, one girl remains unchanged. 
A slight garden mishap calls for a supply run to the outside where she makes a life-changing discovery. The zombies only eat males. Now Mara Mitchell is on a mission to make friends with the undead or kill them all. She finds us out. They only eat this male in front of her and walk, leaves her alone, doesn't attack her. And she decides that she's going to try and make friends with the zombies. And they start pointing at her and saying stuff like, nerd, ugly. <laughs> so they keep picking on her. She goes back home, decides she'd dress herself up a little bit like a zombie and see if she could fit in with them that way. That doesn't work too well. She hangs out with them for a little while, but then they just start teasing her again. And then she's like, well, should I just start killing them? It's like, why have them around if they're not going to be friends with me? And they're just starting to be mean to me and doing things to her. So yeah, I don't want to go too far into it. The thing I love is when they, the zombies sit there, <laughs> are sick of her and they, sit there and give her some signs like sticking a little <laughs> arm in her mailbox with a certain finger sticking up in here <laughs> a zombie arm but it's just it's fun the little things that they do to her in this and this is a nice quick read i read this in one sitting and yeah I, it's another one i'd love to see going on i'd love to see what happens to her in the future I, she does put signs out all over hoping that someone will find her and at the end, she kind of like decides to leave this place for a while and go searching for other stuff. And then you may or may not see someone or some others show up that just before she leaves and stuff. So, but yeah, if you like zombies, it's definitely a fun one for you. And then I bought this because of the cover. It's Howard the Duck number one. It's got Man Thing on the cover, but sadly, Man Thing's not in here. But this was fun, typical Howard Duck in jail because he's trying to do stuff, doing his private detective stuff, gets himself thrown in jail all the time for things. And he meets uh, the male part of the prison. There is, I forgot what was going on, but so he had to go sit with the females and he hooks up with a friend. She's a female tattooist. And they end up being friendly and he ends up having a quest to find an amulet that the black black cat stole, I believe. And she ends up giving him some information because she lives near where the black cat lives. And he hooks up with Spider-Man for a while looking for some information. Spidey helps him out a little bit. It's a it's fun ongoing thing. I bought this in number four because of the covers. I was about to read number four, and I'm like, no way. I got to buy two and three. There's just no choice because at the end, you just happen to see someone pop up in there that mm. I, I got to gotta know what's all going on with it. So, And that's the Chips and Earth Key Joe Quinona series, I believe, creator team? Uh, that's, probably. That's going to be <laughs> a variant cover, so I didn't recognize the cover at all, but uh, just to kind of, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. They did two different volumes. They fell victim to the Marvel Now and all new Marvel Now. So they had like two number ones in the same year, but it was the same creative team. So when you seek out those other issues, just know that there's going to be some, you know, two very short mini series and there's some double numberings in there. So okay, yeah. watch those volume numbers. So. Yeah, and then. Uh... I like the synopsis of this. I had to check out. It's issue number double zero. It's Obey Me. It's about a lady that's, she's an assassin type. And there's a Doberman that's basically like a hellhound and he speaks. And so she hooks up with him. He helps. He can see everything, see where the demons are, helps her find everything. And even helps bring her things when she needs them. Like an assassin's head. Wow. <laughs> like, Good this is such a fun story. I, I don't know where it's going. I don't know what's going to happen. They don't give you enough of what she is because this is a double zero, so they like to just play with you with the zero. 
and a half issues. But she's she's a bad at bad. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you like anything with actions, demons, you'll like this. It's definitely fun. Obey me. And then we got Katrina. It's a vampire one. I decided to check out. And it goes back to Hurricane Katrina. And this gal's a cop. And her mother's all worried about it. They're trying to get everybody out of the city. And she's saying things that shouldn't leave. Daughter feels the same way. Other people feel the same way. So they get everybody they can out, get them to the stadium and stuff like that. And then she starts doing some searching. There's some unknown forces that are found and out and about that are going to be introducing us to more vampiric stuff, which I can't wait for episode issue two. But this one definitely doesn't go deep enough to tell you anything that's really going to happen. It mainly focuses on the hurricane coming and what getting everybody out for right now. But yeah, it's, if you like vampires, it's interesting new take, something to check out. Well, not really new because New Orleans, but I'm hoping there's going to be some new style in there. Oh, yeah, Army of Darkness, Ash gets hitched. <laughs> this basically takes place right after Army of Darkness, I'm guessing, because it's still got the same people in it. Nimmer Generals and stuff are there. They got the Red Beard and stuff, Henry. And uh, they're. He's met up with a woman, decided that he's going to stay, and they're going to get married. And, of course, everything goes bad, and there's deadites popping and stuff. The two armies call, are called to come to, to them, and they just get slaughtered by these uh, deadites. And it's just your typical Army of Darkness thing. But, of course, it's issue number one, so I'm waiting for more information on the wedding and everything. So I'm going to have to buy more of those. And this one I bought because of the cover. <laughs> it's the Uncanny Inhumans issue number one. With oh. Howard on the cover. I just, I'm like, Howard Inhumans? I mean, they keep doing these damn covers and tricking me. But <laughs> I, I, I keep falling for it. So he's not but, in there. No, Howard's not in here, sadly. It's basically Black Bolt and his woman arguing throughout it and there's people trying to find these pods that have people in them there uh i don't know the full story of it yeah but... they're in the they're in the terragenesis uh you know i think during that uncanny inhumans where a lot where the i think that was the start when a bunch of uh terragenic mist went through and then uh People who are have the inhuman gene kind of get turned and have these little pods, and then they break out and have their reveal if they have inhuman powers or not. Yeah, because you find out about Black Bolt with him and his son, and it's just, I just, I mean, Black Bolt, and they do the back thing where he goes back into a wartime era and basically tells them goodbye <laughs> and they all just disappear because black bolt cannot speak without wiping everything out and uh king the conqueror makes an appearance in here and it's kind of weird i don't know the whole inhuman story so i'm not big on it yet it hasn't really sucked me in I mean, the only reason i bought this is because howard of course on the cover but yeah. this is my first in introduction to king the conqueror other than through spider ham with <laughs> that version but uh it's very interesting how he's taking care of black bolt's son and stuff like that you get the backstory on all that in here but yeah it's the start of all that if you're into the inhumans it's definitely a good read yeah i think I, that was a real tremendous run and i think that's charles soul if i'm not mistaken for the writer on that one yeah um, but yeah, that uh, I haven't, I hadn't read too much in humans at the time either, and uh, 
that uncanny run was really good. There's a lot of new stuff they brought to uh to the Inhumans, some characters that will be sticking around, but uh yeah, good stuff. Uh, in dark red, we're up to number ten. This is still holding strong. Anybody else still reading this? Put your hand up. No? Nope. Okay. Well, in this issue, it gets more into the fight, the battle between the shapeshifters and the vampires and stuff like that. And then the little weird child that hangs around with him ends up getting uh, a new family in this and stuff. But this is definitely still a strong vampire story that's totally different from anything else. And I am just loving this one. So check out Dark Red number 10. For the kids out there, yeah, Jim's Jim's not here, but uh, he's still reading it because I got a copy here for him. Yeah, I knew one of them was, but I thought David was too, but I guess not. So, for the kids out there, I guess, and for some of the young adults, we got Police Academy issue number one, two, and three. <laughs> this is a fun little fallback. It's just like this. Each one has two stories in it. It's basically. The same comedy that you get from the movies. Uh, they do all kinds of little things. You get your main characters, Hightower. And <laughs> I can't think of all the names offhand right now, but pretty much got them all there. Bobcat, Goldthwait, and all the guys. But uh, it's your campy comedy. Nice and simple, family friendly. <laughs> I don't know if they did more than these or what. Each one at the end will, has uh, two of the characters with a little synopsis of them. Yeah, they probably did a, a run for each of the 24 movies, I think. so. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> but, yeah, just a little police banter saying <laughs> descriptions of what they like, what they do, what, what they did before they were cops and stuff like that. So. So yeah, if you like Police Academy, it's a fun little comic book for you. And the last one we got here, I don't, I'm assuming this was separate issues and they put this together for this. I bought it because of the cover at The Purge, I believe I bought this. And it's basically got like a lizard, lizard guy with the same look as the goblin from Spider-Man with a bat, a bone... Just a skeleton bat with flames that he flies around on. So it's, I take it as the goblin. It could be also, or the hobgoblins. The one I get from it, because he has a little chain on his side, like the hobgoblin has with his little pumpkin bomb bag and stuff. But yet, this could be more of the green goblin, because in this storyline, the green goblin's more focused on here. But this is the bleeding edge which is uh, your absolute carnage. I believe there's five sections in here, so I'm guessing this was originally five comics and they put it together as one. But it's a very fun storyline. Spider-Man and Venom, and Venom working together. Venom's son's in here. Uh, you got Carnage after him. Carnage has all his symbiote characters that he's just taking all these little symbiote pieces from anybody that had them and turning them into creatures and he also has his own little symbiotes that he's making new new creatures as you go i didn't read the full storyline i just read a couple of the absolute carnage things which i really enjoyed this i really enjoyed but it also still leaves you hanging at the end so you're gonna want more <laughs> but so i guess i'm gonna have to get the whole storyline but yeah there's my quick Quick run. Um, going back to the Howard the Duck, uh, do you have that issue issue four near you? No, it's upstairs. <laughs> Doctor Strange on the cover by chance? Nope. Okay, because you might have an issue number one from the volume four series and uh, issue number four from the volume five series, possibly. Oh, now you just ruined my day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're welcome. Um, so yeah, the one volume has five issues total, which you started at the true number one. And then vol the next volume has 11 issues. I think he's talking to Shelly, but just so you know, the second volume has 11 issues. 
So there'll be five and 11. And from uh, the second volume, I don't know if I've showed this on here before. I'm going to go to my screen so I can see it here. Um, a variant cover. This is a higher end uh, one that I uh, needed to find on eBay. But in the storyline, Leah Thompson came into the story as herself. So the character of Beverly was also in the story, but Leah Thompson as a character came into the story. And uh, this was an awesome variant cover from that run there. So, but I wanted to give you that. Uh, oh, do you have it right there? Yeah, she's with Man Thing on the cover. Okay, okay, that's the number one issue. Yeah, this one's worth more money, probably. Probably. <laughs> I think one million dollars. I think it is. So anything with Leah's worth tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> but yep, just so you know, if you track down those issues, uh, yeah, they can be confusing with the numbering because it could be very easily to read, you know, one of the wrong numbers in the wrong volume. Oh yeah, I mean, Midtown does put that on the sticker, which is nice. But I didn't never. I'm waiting for her to bring it down for me. But this one, this one's volume four, number one. So I'm kind of curious what the other one says now. Yeah, so if if that other one uh, has Doctor Strange on it, then you're within that same five-issue volume. But if no, not... I bought it because it was a cover that I like, so I wouldn't buy it because of Doctor Strange. Yeah. Um, Unless Galact it had... <laughs> Does it have Galactus on it? Oh, Shelly, did you find it? This could all be taken care of off air too, but I figured, you know, why not? Anyways, um, while we settle that, that is going to conclude the weekly uh, review section. So we are going to jump over to the letters page. Okay, audio stopped. Save. We're not under the call. Watch your language. <laughs> Okay, I was wrong. It's number five. Okay. Volume four, volume four, number five. Okay, so you have the first and last issue of that volume. Oh, really? That's it? All they had was five? For that volume, but the same creative team did a second volume of 11 issues because they were doing this all new Marvel Now thing. So mm -hmm. it's all part of the same run and comedic, comedic team, but you currently have the start and beginning of the first volume. So, yeah. cool. So there's really like 16 issues. Technically, yes, yeah. <laughs> Just all randomly thrown yeah. around. World Girl was the other series that fell victim to having yeah. two That's number why ones. Not this one because of Squirrel Girl on the cover. Yeah, they both had two number one issues within the same year before they got restarted with the same team. So. Anyways, um, I think they even said that on one of the covers, too, uh, to make fun of that. So, Okay, so we are going to hit record and jump into the letters page. Here we go. Welcome to the letters page, everybody. We are going to discuss a question. We're going to throw it around to everybody. This week's uh, discussion topic, as I bring it back up here, is going to be... What character death would make you, quote unquote, stop reading comics? Uh, an example would be uh, Mike Allred when the death of Gwen Stacy happened in real time, uh, publication wise, I, I mean. Um, he gave up comics. It took him a while to come back, but as a young kid, he was very devastated to see his comic book crush get killed. And at that time, you know, she stayed dead. She's been brought back many different versions and stories and all that kind of stuff but um so that's kind of the question i'm posing you can answer it any way you want my example or the my answer rather is going to take it out of marvel and dc superhero comics because the silver surfer could die it's not going to do anything to me because i just know that he's going to be back that's not going to be something where i'm like you know what i'm i'm done with it but if they did something with like giant days for instance Taking characters where if they would die, it would actually stay. That's a series where it would actually mean something. That would be a pretty heavy hit. Now, it's not going to make me quote-unquote quick comics because that's part of the question. It would just be something that would actually rattle me. I would have to take a pause and 
knowing that if they killed one of the three girls, Daisy, Esther, or uh, um, the other one that I can't think of right now, um, Susan, Susan, if they killed one of those characters, I just know it's a permanent decision and it would really hurt. So that's my answer is any of the three main characters from Giant Days. Although Damon. possibly kill yeah. off one of them, it wouldn't matter too much because she's kind of forgettable. What was her name? Uh, the... no. Yeah, uh, S- S- Sammy, S- Slippy, Slappy, Swami, Swanson, S- Swanson? Check, check the briefcase. Samsonite. Samsonite. I was way off. Okay, anyways, uh, Damon, what are your three or four runner-up options? I don't really have any. Whoa. I mean, there are some characters where if they killed, it would, it would definitely hurt. Yeah. You know, like, uh, if, if they killed off, like, Lady Death or Hell Witch or Howard the Duck or, you know, stuff like that. But I, not, it, it, I don't think it would push me off of comics. Yeah. The only thing that would really give me a bad taste to push me away is if they stopped, like, the horror genre. Ooh. You know, if they got said, all right, no more like R rated or scary. The comics uh, code comes back. Horror themed uh, comics, that would really take me off because that's been my favorite genre since I was a kid. And so, I mean, if you look at my bookshelves, they're like 80% all basically horror or sci fi stuff. And uh, if you stop doing that, that would give me a bad enough taste that I'd say, you know what, fine, you know, bleep off. I'm done. I'll go back to movies or, you know, novels, you know, that, that's what would really give me a bad taste, but individual characters, since I haven't been reading comics for more than a year or two, um, I'm not fully vested. I I don't think it would really push me off. It it might take me off, but it wouldn't push me off of comics as a medium. Yeah. I think that was definitely a good answer, bringing the genre into it. And kind of like I said with the quote unquote, you know, like, I'm not going to stop reading Giant Days if something like that happens, but it's something big enough that kind of makes you really feel something. Like, Wonder Woman, Dead Earth. We saw Superman get, you know, Diana punched right through his chest. Yeah, While I'm, it, I'm, I'm, David's I'm, done. I'm done. David's done. I took his answer. <laughs> uh, but it's it actually was funny because my answer was going to be, I was jokingly going to be, yeah, if they ever killed Superman, you know, <laughs> Because, you know, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't kill Superman. But if they ever killed Superman, yeah, I'd be, I'd be done. And I was trying to figure out how to phrase that question because using that Superman example, it's just like, all right, you know it's its own little separate book and continuity and another Superman comic comes out tomorrow, you know. Because but There were, when they did the death of Superman, there were a number of people that were like, I'm done, I'm yeah. finished, which I never got because apparently – a lot of people didn't know this. I knew it. I thought it was like a common knowledge type of thing that it was going to be like a year long thing. And I knew as soon as they killed him off, he was coming back. And that wasn't even that typical for them to do. Whereas now it's like, now every character's killed off and brought back. Uh, but it, it wasn't so common when they did that. Um, but I knew at the time it was like going to be like a year long thing. And then they were bringing him back. So it was no, not a big deal. And, you know, back in 2012, uh, when Dan Slott did that with Peter Parker, and then a Superior Spider-Man started, like, yeah, it was one month later when you got Superior Spider-Man number one, and you have Peter Parker as, like, a ghost entity. And he's throughout that series. Like, it's like, yeah, you're not, those characters aren't going away. But, yeah, it still rattled people to, you know, send him death threats, which are – Obviously, very you know, stable people making those threats, uh, and and really because of the very temporary nature of comic book deaths, um, I don't know that there's really anybody that that they could kill off, and I'd be like, you know what, that's I'm I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Um, sometimes they kill characters off, and you're like, here we go again. Um, and I, I wish the deaths could mean something. Um, it's so common that now they kill somebody off and you don't even care. You're like, oh, well, I guess I have to go a, a year without seeing this character. Maybe a couple of years. But it goes by so fast, you, you know, by the time you bring them back. Um, I mean, it didn't, 
didn't even seem like Wolverine was gone. Of course, you had like five different replacements for him. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just such a temporary thing that it's really difficult. So I guess the only um, character that I could say, I, I would say, if, if they killed off the Watchmen, mm. uh, if, if the Watchmen died, I would no longer read comic books. <laughs> It's a great answer. Great answer. All right, uh, Kirby, do you got one for us? Well, basically, I can't say anything Marvel or DC because they've all been killed. We've zombified all them. <laughs> it's like most of the other characters have been, the big time characters have been killed and all the other things, or they're already undead or dead. So you can't really say that. So I, I had to think of someone that was actually new to me and. Someone that's actually friendly, I can't see her being put through anything like that, but that would have to be Squirrel Girl. I mean, mean, if you torture and abuse and kill off Squirrel Girl, then that's just the end of humanity in comics as far as I'm concerned. And so she's trying to be friendly with everybody. And And thankfully for us, she's unbeatable. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> yes, but if she died it would be the same thing you know you'd have the, the death of squirrel girl storyline followed by a squirrel girl death is nuts <laughs> death by nuts <laughs> that's a different story she had an uh-huh. allergy this whole time <laughs> <laughs> but yep another good answer uh katie do you got an answer for us I do. So um, one that I think would really make me quite sad and maybe want to stop reading the series for a while would be if they killed off Wonder Woman. Now, it's probably been done before, uh, given the nature of DC and Marvel comics, but I I would definitely feel sad about that one. Less so because I know she's coming back. She's a flagship character, but, you know, she's just someone who's like so hopeful and always like looking for the best and trying to resolve conflicts and inspire people to be them best selves. So it would be really low if someone took her out. But I could see them spinning it really heroic, like she's going to be the last defender and she's taken down the big bad to sacrifice herself and save the whole world and there'll be puppies and rainbows and peace signs everywhere and RIP Diana. So that would be sad. And I think it'd, it'd be how they'd spin it that would make me be like, this is a, a impactful sad or versus a, this is just like un, unbearable sad. <laughs> Yeah, that's a beautiful statue. She would die, and then she would conquer death, and she would be back. Yeah, she probably would. She would, you know, well, because she is a goddess, she would probably actually go to the real god of death and, like, negotiate with them. I don't I don't know their gender. And, you know, have some magical artifact that would save things and make it better. Yeah, probably come back, rip and roar, and ready to go. I will say though, about three years ago when I did start getting into comics, like they had just killed, I think, Black Widow in one of the main storylines. And I was like, oh my God, how could they do this? She's such a, you know, character in the movies and people like her. And they had killed off the Hulk. And I was just like, what's going on? And then you guys were like, you're new here. Don't worry. They're coming back. It's fine. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that the fleeting nature of death in comics does make it, you know, somewhat hard to get worked up about but yeah i'd say wonder woman yeah it's like as i look around for various things you know uh different characters you know batman been killed off brought back you know uh green lantern been killed off brought back every everything that i look at to go huh, who hasn't been killed uh i'm i'm not sure that wonder woman has yet but i'm sure oh no whatever you know it's, it's only a matter of time I oh think- yeah I think the worst that would ever happen is if she like lost an arm or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh wow, well, that would be maybe hard. that's uh, issue four of Wonder Woman: Dead Earth. Ooh, uh, this one uh, for those video watchers, uh, signed by artist Jenny Frizen, who uh, is Hopefully. the the inspiration for the design on this here. Well, look, the arm goes right back, and she's all right. So that's good. All right. I think those were all good answers to that. Um, We will move over to the news. All right. Save. We're down here before I know. Yeah, you can't can't see because of the glare on the head, but I was, you know, thinking Spawn over here. Boy, I hope they never kill Spawn. Oh. I was just thinking that too. I'm like, wow, that would be so upsetting. 
I had, I had my screen on the uh, the garage band as I was setting that up, and I just uh -huh. heard you couldn't see because of the glare on the head, and I'm like, is he talking about? Oh wait, not talking about me. Yes, that would only be oh, Kirby. Though. We all have filters now, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, here's my. I always wear my wig, and I just have to kind of adjust it when I. Um... Here's my filter. Pull out. All right. Hi, Amy. <laughs> okay, record. Here we go. Welcome to the news section. Last week we did part one of our previews preview, which covered Marvel and DC picks for the month of September and beyond. This month, or this week rather, we're going to cover uh, the independent side of the catalog, the publishers, the the uh, the merchandise, the apparel, the collectibles, all of that fun stuff, whatever you find, um, because we aren't, uh, we don't always all have physical catalogs anymore. Um, we're basically just not going to stick around to any publishers. Basically, we're going to go around the internet, just say whatever you want, let us know when you've reached your last pick. Um, so yep, yeah, it doesn't matter where you choose from. So let me, uh, queue up the September order here. Um, over at IDW, um, looks like there is, uh, what's probably going to be possibly four one shots, but it's a pretty cool design cover of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Raph is one that comes out for, uh, the month of September. And it's got this cool red background, like kind of cover going on. Uh, Dev, it seems like it might be like a little like mini collection or oversized issue of uh, of uh, raft centric stories. I'm not sure where they're pulling from, but the design of the cover really uh, pulled me in, and it looks like they'll probably do the other three turtles for the next three months. So um, there it is. David's bringing it up with the nice. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's both a very simple design, but a very unique design that. I think they're all going to look pretty sweet together. So, um, so yeah, I am going to say Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Raph. Uh, Damon? Okay, my first pick is from Dynamite. Um, and since I wasn't uh, at the podcast for last month's, I'm going to show last month's picture because the picture is so cool. Um, but I am definitely getting, uh, even if the story sucks, I'm picking this issue up for the cover. Mars Attacks, Red Sonia. <laughs> nice. That looks, it's a cool cover, but that idea of Mars coming to attack in the time of Red Sonia, you know, that barbarian age, how would they fight against the Martian technology and everything? That just uh, intrigues me. But in the current previews will be issue two. And here you got the little green dude Riding on top of this big, ugly, nasty, fighting Red Sonia. So I'm hoping the series as good in real life as it is in my head, because what I'm picturing is going to be a lot of fun, but we'll have to wait and see. But, uh, yeah, Mars Attacks Red Sonia. I'm hoping it's fun. Cool. David? Uh, nothing says the 80s like Transformers Terminator. <laughs> nice. I saw that, and all I can picture is the Terminator getting hit by a truck and just being drugged down the highway. Uh, but in this case, it's uh, this is actually available in November. There we go. Uh, you'll be back, right? Oh, I was waiting to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Autobots, I'll be back. And, and it's a story that takes place in 1984. So... Um, yeah, Skynet versus Cybertron in a crossover for the ages. 96 uh, page trade paperback for $15.99. So that's November. Cool, cool. Uh, Kirby. I'm going to, I want to check out Dracula Mother Paper. <laughs> yes. It, oh, is that how you Vienna, Vienna 1889, Dracula's Brides. Nail him to the bottom of his coffin. Los Angeles, 1974. An aging starlet decides to raise the stakes. Crime scene photographer Quincy Harker is the only man who knows it. 
happen, but will anyone believe him before he gets his own chalk outline? And are Dracula's three brides there to help him or use him as bait? A pulpy, pulse-pounding graphic novel of California psych horror from acclaimed creators Alex DeCampi and Erica Henderson. I'm hoping it's got some shaft, Foxy Brown type feel to it, but it looks like my kind of thing. Yeah, this one's on my list. Uh, Erica Henderson, by the way, is the artist from the Unbeatable Squirrel Girl who did the majority of that run. So, Cool. All right, uh, Katie. Okay, so my first pick's from Image Comics. It's called Inkblot, number one. It's by Emma Kubert, Rusty Glad. Uh, the premise is that there is a sorceress who is trying to cor correct her greatest mistake, which was the creation of a magical cat that can travel through time, space, and reality. Uh, ships in September. Uh, sounds cool. It's a number one. It's high fantasy. There's a time traveling cat, which can only lead to good things. So I want to try that. Yeah, that one's on my list. Well, and uh, with uh, Emma Kubert being uh, another generation of the Kubert family, so jumping into comics there. So it's cool. All right, um, my next pick here is from Dark Horse Comics, a four issue miniseries, Spy Island number one. Originally meant to come out back in spring, but it was now delayed for the fall here. Super spy Nora uh, Freud, no relation, has a plum assignment. She's stationed on a tropical island. Her mission, keep an eye on things. Her problem, the island is on the lip of the Bermuda Triangle where anything can happen. Her other problem, this particular island is a den of intrigue populated by spies, tourists, and the evil villains set on global domination. Um, this drew my attention with uh, writer Chelsea Kane, who did the Maneater series, as well as the Mockingbird miniseries from Marvel, uh, with art by Elise McCall, colors by Rochelle Rosenberg, awesome creative team, Spy Island, if you like the Bermuda Triangle stuff, four-issue miniseries, Dark Horse. Damon. My next pick is also from Dark Horse. It is the Helsing Deluxe Edition, Volume 2. Uh, not too long ago, I did a review of the Berserk uh, manga and how I'm, I'm, I'm really starting to get into the manga and I like the Berserk in this deluxe edition format. So when I heard Helsing was coming out, uh, I really wanted to jump on that. Volume 1, I think, comes out either next week or the week after. Uh, this one goes on sale on November 18th. Um, Helsing is a, a manga, deals with like uh, werewolves and vampires and all kinds of nasties. For volume two here, it says the Helsing organization is under siege by the undead Nazi army of the Millennium Project, who are turning the London streets into rivers of blood. And with this murderous conflict at a fever pitch, the Vatican sees an opportunity to take down both Millennium and Helsing in one swift stroke. So it sounds like it's going to be very violent, very bloody, and very cool. Cool. Uh, David. Well, this one I was trying to figure out exactly here because uh, it's under Boom's September releases. Um, but, and, and what they've got, the first one up is Wind number one. Okay. And I was looking for the release date over here, which I'm not seeing. Um, but again, it's under September releases. The confusing thing is that over here, we also have solicitations for uh, two, three, and four. And if you look at when it says that they're released, we've got July, August, and September. So I don't recall or know if that's been out yet, but that, that's a little confusing that they have uh, number one under the September releases and yet have two, three, and four listed for July, August, and September. Yeah, Wind, I think, actually is one of those, kind of like the Black Widow number one that uh, when Katie had mentioned her interest last week, I had said how that one had come out, even though it, like some stores weren't going to get it and some were. Mm -hmm. um, I think Wind was another one of those that fell under that but copies got out while they also decided to just pause the series until fall. So that might just be a re-advertising, especially for something that's not having a major motion picture coming out attached to it, you know? So I'm thinking that's where that lies so people don't miss out on that. And I thought maybe, you know, it's got some some names like James Tinney and that, uh, you know, yeah. might might be things that you'd be interested in. Uh, in this case, it's about uh, a, a place where magic is outlawed. So we got somebody, uh, a pointy-eared uh, 
guy that's uh, got to go around and hide his uh, use of magic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks interesting. And just the way it's solicited, it comes across as a little bit uh, confusing on when it comes out versus others. And we have seen where some issues of books have come out with all this, uh, and then an, an earlier issue comes out afterwards. So um, in just, just the way that everything has been uh, backed up, just the, the releases of it, some, some of the things haven't actually shipped in order. Uh, Kirby. Grim Terry, Grim Terry, <laughs> Grim Fairy Tales presents Grim Tales of Terror, quarterly number one. For centuries, the Order of the Secret Circle has lurked in the shadows, reinventing itself for each new generation. And ongoing by many names, the Order of the Temple of the East, the Order of Night, and the Hellfire Club, it seeks to bend the nine demons of hell to its will. In 1912, Aleister Crowley took control of Hellfire and attempted to bring the great beast under control, under his control, while ultimately falling. The ripples from the dark spell echo to, to the present, calling forth a new congregation who seek to reform Hellfire and tap into the evil power it promises. This looks interesting, and along with it, you can also check out Grim Fairy Tales Presents Van Helsing vs. the League of Monsters, which I've been enjoying all the little Van Helsing side series that I've been reading. So, cool, yeah, cool. lots of good stuff, and the covers look awesome. All right, over at Image Comics, we have, uh, speaking of James Tinian, he has a new series called Department of Truth, number one. This is a series premiere. Cole Turner has studied conspiracy theories all of his life, but he isn't prepared for what happens when he discovers that all of them are true, from the JFK assassination to flat earth theory and reptilian shapeshifters. One organization has been covering them up for generations. What is the deep, dark secret behind the Department of Truth? Um, even though this had the great creative team, Image Comic, I'm like, you know what? There's just a lot of series. I don't need this. Until I saw that uh, one of my favorite artists, Jenny Frizen, who designed that Wonder Woman statue that I just had up, she does a variant cover for number one. I'm like, well, I'm definitely wanted for that cover. She's one of maybe five artists that I'll buy a variant for, whether I'm interested in the series or not. And who knows, maybe I'll end up liking it, but I'll at least get my three or four dollars worth or so on the uh, awesome variant from Jenny Frizen. But still sounds like an awesome series. James Tinian, strong uh, writer there. And then Martin Simmons uh, does the art. So that is, uh, oh, and oh yeah, it is a cover B. Okay, and that is Department of Truth, number one. Damon. Uh, volume. <laughs> That's my wife's fault. Uh, my next pick is... Uh, uh, an omnibus, actually, that I didn't of a series I didn't even know existed. Uh, ten years ago, there was a little horror anthology movie called Trick or Treat, and apparently there has been a comic book series uh, based off of the the movie and stories like it. So there is going to be a Trick or Treat uh, graphic novel omnibus. Um, I was I like the movie, and this is gonna. Um, Bring the full compendium of uh, Twisted Halloween Tales, brought to life by Top Notch team of creators. I'm not going to list everybody here. We'd be here all night. But this new deluxe edition features all new cover art and brings all of Sam's stories together into one collection for the first time. So even though I never ex knew it existed, I don't have to hunt them down. I can get it all in one shot. So that looks very appealing to me. Cool. Uh, David. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, not a comic, but if you're a toy collector, and I know that uh, the old shop, we had a gentleman who would come in every once in a while, and his big thing was Masters of the Universe. Well, they have uh, the Toys of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe hardcover, which is a 700-page uh, book, basically chronicling all the various Masters of the Universe toys that they have had over the years, including She-Ra and, and, and a lot of the other stuff. So, um, you know, might, might be a nice 
addition to have if you're a toy collector, especially a Masters of the Universe toy collector, um, to have all that information, all those toys and everything in one place. Um, yeah. It is a hardcover, um, $59.99. So, um, you know, it's not something that uh, I think is, you know, people are just going to grab just to have. Um, but I know that there's there's a couple uh, people out there that are into this stuff that might be interested in having a book like that. And if you're a big toy collector like uh, Kurt, he would probably open up the toy so he can like really see what uh, numbers and models he has. And then he would take that book and then cross it off with Sharpie when he gets to it on that page. So he makes sure he gets everything. Or uh, being a hardcover, it might come wrapped in cellophane, which he probably would not open. Uh, yes, uh, Kirby. All right, Shiver, Shiver Bureau. It's a graphic novel collecting all seven issues, a cross between Sherlock Holmes and Ghostbusters. Shiver Bureau is a tale of formidable detective that is forced into a partnership with a wisecracking hotshot inspector to save London from being overrun by ghosts and monsters. Racing through the city to solve a case of missing orphans, they run into gangs, ghosts, dockside mafia, and a giant monster, all while trying not to kill each other. This just looked like something that would be fun. I'd like to check it out. Cool. It's by Scout Comics. So I, I know they do weird stuff. So. All right. Um, as a public service announcement, uh, X-Ray Robot number two is going to be picking up in September from Dark Horse Comics, one of our club picks. Um, so the issue number one came out back in March. Two now starts in September. And the issue that I appear in is issue number three. So we're just getting months away until I never have to talk about this again. So, And I forgot to mention also that that was another character I thought about. If they did kill off Anthony's character in that, that may put me off comic. Uh-oh. Well, just <laughs> tune in for the issue. That's all I'll say. I have um, a pick. Oh, yes, yes, Katie. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so from Titan Comics, there's a Doctor Who uh, event comic coming out called Time Lord Victorious, and it's focusing on the 10th Doctor, and he's going to – Fight the Daleks, and apparently an enemy that is so scary, even the Daleks are afraid of it. Uh, it's written by Jody Hauser. She's been doing the main series of books and illustrated by Roberta in Granada. Uh, it ships in September, and it costs $6. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, jump over to Damon. Uh, volume. <laughs> Damn it, Amy. Oh, Amy. <laughs> Amy. <laughs> He's right there. You can yell at her and blame her. Um, my next pick is probably the most important one to me in the whole book. Is that, and this is my last pick, too. Um, it's a toy. Uh, uh, much to my wife's uh, disagreement, I'm also a toy collector, too. And um, one of the things that I've always wanted, there's been a shortage of good 1989 Batmans. <laughs> and SH Figure Arts, which releases some very good yeah. Uh, action figures is finally doing a 1989 Batman and it looks really good and I will be picking this up in November when it comes out and uh, you don't need to know about it <laughs> I think you deserve it after all uh, the numerous uh, assaults she's taken at the audio of your uh, your discussion here so it's okay. All I got to do is just flip to the pop page and hand her the book and she'll forget all about it. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a bit on that page. David. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, that was Superman, uh, for our, uh, audio listeners. Um, I, Kirby, I can finish it off with Vampirella Trial of the Soul one shot. It's does Vampirella have a soul? This is the question being asked by an immortal wizard king, who has come to deter, de, determine her fate. If she does, she will be spared. If not, he must destroy her, no matter how charming her he finds her. 
this can't miss standalone tale introduces the latest member of Vampy's spine tingling rogues gallery, Eisner award winning fantasy ma maestro Bill Willingham from Fables and Robin brings this fable to the page with a haunting cover by Bart Sears from Torok and Bray Blade and <laughs> interiors by Giuseppe <laughs> Caparo from Justice League vs. Suicide Squad. I hope so it's one shot from Vampirella I want to check out. And if you want to stick with the vampire and the toys, if anybody's looking for anything for me, buy me, you can buy me that Elvira Couture de Force figurine. <laughs> it's only $64. <laughs> Put it on Jim's credit card. <laughs> All right, Katie. Uh, my next pick is from Albatross. Uh, this is actually official. It looks like it is called Fearless Dawn Meets Hellboy by Mike Mignola and Steve Mannion. Uh, I do love Hellboy. It's awesome. So it looks like they're going to mash up those two characters. A misadventure in Romania drops Hellboy into the middle of the paranormal mission of Fearless Dawn's crew. I've never read anything about Fearless Dawn, but I'd try it. Uh, this meeting of heroes is no picnic. So it's... Uh, Oh my goodness, it's in stock on my birthday. It's uh, middle of September and it's $4. Uh, Mike Magnolia, Steve Mannion. The cover uh, looks a little different from Magnolia's art, so we'll see what the inside looks like, but always fun with Hellboy. And I think there's, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know, there might be two different covers. He might do one of them and maybe the other creator does the other. Yeah, that would make sense. But this is one that was another one that was supposed to come out back in spring, so I was glad to see it show up in this catalog. So. All right, uh, a pick I am excited for from Keen Spot Comics is Belle Zebub, number one. Uh, Belle is your typical grade schooler, except for an important detail. Her mother was an honest-to-goodness angel, like she literally fell from heaven. And her father is B.L. Zebub, one of the seven princes of darkness. Belle takes after her mother, but her supernatural powers are partly darkness-based, so things tend to go wrong for poor Belle. It's no wonder why her best friend is a zombie that's allergic to human flesh. Together, they all try their best to fit into suburbia. Belle Zebub is the name that drew my attention. It's a fun, all-ages comic, what it looks like. Uh, she's part angel and part devil and all kid. So that's Belle Zebub. So that one I'm excited for. Um, and did anybody, Kate, is it just me and Katie left for picks then? So Katie, if you yep. have any more. Okay, I think uh, this will be my last one. It's from Boom Studios. It's called Unkindness of Ravens by Dan Panosian and the art is by Mariana Ignazi. Uh, sounds like there's a descendant of some of the witches from Salem who survived the trials and she's now the new girl in school and she plans to go completely unnoticed except that she bears an eerie resemblance to the Raven member Waverly and Waverly just went missing. So it sounds like this comic is going to be about solving Waverly's disappearance while trying to stay out of the scenes. Uh, anyway, from Boom Studios, that is Unkindness of Ravens, number one. And that's my last pick. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and I'm just going to fire these off without uh, giving any descriptions beyond what I remember. Um, Sex Criminals issue number 69 is coming out, which is funny because the previous issue is issue number 30. So the series ends with issue number 69. There are two awesome uh you know, they got the triple X covers there with some great artists there, and you don't know what they are until you open them up. But uh, the finale to the series about a couple who uh, can stop time when they orgasm so they can rob banks. So that's Sex Criminals number 69. That series is ending. Uh, that was drawn by Chip Zdarsky. He has a series he's writing uh, called Stillwater. It looks like a horror uh horror series from Image, so I'm excited for that because he's just such a versatile writer and artist. Um, then we have over in Archie, there is a Betty and Veronica Bond of Friendship original graphic novel. I think that might be part of their new young adult, uh, like middle grade uh, original graphic novel, so of course I'm getting that. Then over at Aftershock, the horror series that was supposed to come out in spring, 
now coming out in fall, Lonely Receiver, uh, number one. That had a pretty badass cover, so I'm excited uh, about that. Um, and then my, uh, I think, oh yeah, uh, Firefly has a two different things. They have a Blue Sun Alpha issue, as well as a Firefly Watch How I Soar original graphic novel. So more Firefly goodness there. And then two final things from Insight Studios. Mean Girls senior year, much like the Clueless, uh, that got a graphic novel um, kind of sequels. Uh, they're doing the same with Mean Girls. I thought it was a very funny movie, so and a very successful uh, Broadway uh, musical as well. But now Mean Girls has come into comics with Mean Girls senior year. And my final thing is not a comic, but from the merchandise. It's the Stan Lee Ragnarok cameo pop figure. So, yep, his cameo of when he went in to give Thor a haircut there is being immortalized as a pop figure. So I am super excited for that one. Hey, it's right. So, yep, that is out there. So that will do it for this issue, a very extra giant size issue of the Crimson Cow Comic Club. We will see you next week. <laughs> For the Spider Ham number five conclusion for our club pick, and well as more weekly reviews. So, this entire time, I never rode the Matterhorn at Disneyland. I've been sitting next to a hungry woman that really wants dinner. I'm Tammy's husband. I drink alone, yeah, with nobody else. <laughs> and I'm Katie. To be continued. All right. Good show, everybody.